Welcome to Lethal Dose, your favorite toxicology-focused podcast where we delve into true crime cases involving drugs and poisons. My name is Venus Dineko. I'm a layperson fascinated by true crime. My name is Kayla Woods. I'm an author and toxicologist. Let's get started. Widowmaker Solar Eclipse He'd been bathed by a sprinkle of tetrachlorodibenzo p dioxin forty years prior, the agent orange spreading slowly, has invaded his left interior descending artery, reducing flow to a trickle. Now, a flat digital screen is projecting his heart, a glowing orange disc dimming beneath a dark moon, covering it in shades of blackness, the bloodless areas of his heart, eclipsing that bright orange sun, the black moon. Blocking light, pauses at the meridian, cloaking his world in dusk, choking off blood flow, suffocating, throttling his heart, the orange circle that is, fading, gasping, airless, dying. Technicians snaring him with coils, leads, and sensors, jungle vines, branches, elephant grass. Tying him to some thallium-powered machine, designed to detect how the Agent Orange has dripped through lungs, liver, kidneys, brain, skin, finding its way to arteries, to his heart. Dropped by a low-flown aircraft, hiding, clinging to, coating jungle vines, Branches, elephant grass, mixing in streams where he walks and drinks. Soaking through fatigues and into open, sweaty pores. Rubbing into eyes, soaking into lungs, coating arteries, waiting in ambush to kill. Killing jungle vines, branches, elephant grass, water buffalo, fish, babies, papasan, mamasan, those born and still yet to be born slowly killing all it touches, turning lush hills into brittle, dead, dusty thickets, clearing a path for the searchers and destroyers, passing through, breathing ash of Agent Orange. Clotting quietly over forty years, it is finally, squeezing the life out of his heart while the dock, punching a hole in his femoral artery, snaking a scope up to his heart, Searching on a black and white screen, finding, snagging clots, opening tunnels to a starving heart, clearing the way for oxygen, giving him time. Until, returning, the black moon, fixed on its course, across the meridian, stops, blocks out the sun, and close the world in forgetfulness. All right, Venus, are you ready for this? I think so. This has been so heavy. There's no way around it. There's no other way to do it. It's war, and it's it's heavy by nature, but hopefully we're doing it justice by not trying to make it too light or anything. After we recorded Agent Orange, I went down a rabbit hole and watched a few documentaries Mm -hmm. about Mm -hmm. Agent Orange and the rainbow herbicides, and I'm not going to lie, I ugly cried more than once. It's some tough stuff. And the listeners out there, you may have noticed that last two weeks when we released the social media for the first Agent Orange episode, that we didn't do any pictures of the birth defects. And that's just out of consideration for the families who are impacted. We don't want to feel like we're glamorizing that in any way. You can go find those if you want to see the kind of impact. You can go watch the documentaries, but that's on you. We're not going to provide that. It was very, very hard to watch, and thinking about how hard it was to watch makes you think about how incredibly hard it would be to live with that. Yeah, and there's so many people who are impacted by it, and I had no idea the true reach of the effects of the herbicides before we started researching for the show. 
Yeah, one of the other things that I learned that was total news to me was that there were more herbicides than just Agent Orange. Mm -hmm. um, I had no idea that's the only one that I had ever heard of. And so I guess why is Agent Orange the most well-known? Agent Orange is the most well-known because it accounted for 60% of the total herbicides that were used. And there were different formulations of orange in particular. There was Agent Orange, Agent Orange 2, Agent Orange 3, and Super Orange. It accounted for most of the herbicides, and that's just because it was cheap. It was cheap to buy for the military, so it was cheap to use. Got it. Always trying to save a buck. Way mm -hmm. to go. Mm -hmm. So what are the other agent's colors in the rainbow herbicide spectrum? So the rainbow of destruction includes agents green, pink, purple, blue, and white. Okay. Are they different on a chemical level? Agents green, pink, and purple are different ratios of 2,4-D and 2,4-5-T, which are the two chemicals present in Agent Orange. So Agent Green is 100% 245T, Agent Pink is also 100% 245T, and it differs just if you look at the molecule of 245T. It's basically just that the hydrogens either point out of the plane or they point behind it. So there's not much of a difference oh. to lay people, mm, but okay. it's just a minute molecular difference. Got it. And then Agent Purple... Instead of being a ratio of 50-50, 245T, and 24D, this one was a ratio of equal parts 24D and 245T, but the 245T was 30% one version of a molecule and 20% another version of a molecule. The different types were kind of combined into one yes, for yeah. purple. Okay. And the other major difference between these agents is that agents green, pink, and purple had two to three times as much dioxin as orange. Oh, so they were even more dangerous? Mm-hmm. They were. And I don't know if that was known at the time. I don't think that was part of the reason that orange was primarily used. I think it was just a price thing. But it's because they have so much more 245T, and mm. you get more dioxin in the formation of 245T, and so they had more dioxin naturally. Yeah, and to try to flex what I remember from the last episode. The dioxin is the dangerous part of these chemicals. That's what is like mutating the genetic structure in people. Yeah, I think 2,4-D and 2,4-5-T are potentially dangerous on their own, but it is the dioxin that's the real danger that is well known and well documented. I learned from our last episode about Agent Orange why they wanted to use herbicides as a part of the war. They mm -hmm. wanted to deforest the jungles because the Viet Cong was able to hide very easily. And so if they were going to defoliate those plants, they wouldn't have as much cover. Why did they decide to switch from Agent Orange to these other herbicides? Agent Orange was not the first one that they used. Agent Orange was not used during the war until 1965. They actually used Agents Purple, Pink, and Green first. But they also used Agent Blue in 1962, and then mm. they began using Agent White in 1965 when they phased out Agent Orange. So there was the whole leaked memo from Dow Chemical, and then the mm -hmm. scientists in 1965, 1969, that era when mm -hmm. the, the memo was leaked and people were starting to find out about the potential for it being a carcinogen and a teratogen, that the government said, okay, we won't use orange. We'll use white instead. Well, and they were using these others that were more dangerous, mm -hmm, but they, mm -hmm. but was it that just that they didn't spend as much time and research into those other agents like they did with Agent Orange? I think that they knew that they could apply the knowledge that they had to the other agents, but they stopped using Agent Green in 1963 for whatever reason. They stopped using Agent Pink in 1964. And I think they stopped using Agent Purple in 1965 along with Agent Orange, and it was just under the umbrella of Agent Orange. We're just going to call it all Agent Orange because it's essentially the same thing. Chemically, it's different, but in terms of the effect, it's the same thing. And so I think that they began using orange instead of green and pink because of the price, and mm. then purple fell under the umbrella of Agent Orange. And so when they said, we'll stop using Agent Orange, they also meant Agent Purple. But because... Yeah white doesn't have 245T and blue doesn't have 245T. It didn't fall under the same umbrella. 
Got it. And so besides Agent Orange, were blue and white the ones that were used the most? Blue and white were used the most. And I think it's because they had continued use to 1971 when the war ended. Total between Agent Orange, Orange 2, Orange 3, and Super Orange, we used 11 million gallons of Agent Orange. What the fuck? We used 2 million gallons of Agent Blue and we used 5 million gallons of Agent White. Is the reason that Agents Blue and White were used more than Green Peak and Purple just because they halted those around the same time as Agent Orange because they had that similar structure or they were more expensive? I would think it's just because they halted it and so they had more time to continue using Agents Blue and White. What were the objectives of Agents Blue and White? Did they differ than Agent Orange as far as their function as an herbicide? Not significantly. Agent White contains 2,4-D and a chemical called Picloram, which is a Tordan brand herbicide. And so there's different formulations of Tordan that had 2,4-D and 2,4-5-T. But Picloram is a different type of hormone mimicking herbicide. And mm. so it has the ability to target dicot. What is a dicot? There's dicots and there's monocots and Sweet potatoes are one, and genuine yams are another. I think the genuine yams are dicots. I could be wrong. It's kind of a, a nuanced thing. I'm not a biologist. But it just means that it will focus on a specific kind of plant, and it won't harm agriculture. Tordon was used domestically. That's why it's Tordon brand from Dow Chemical. That you could use it, and it was supposed to be this, like, amazing thing. All of these herbicides are supposed to be amazing and help agriculture and improve agriculture. And so they were supposed to improve quality of life for people. And so it was able to target perennial woody species. This Tordon was especially. So it was kind of like the alternative to 245T where it was able to target woody perennial species. It essentially, it was targeting different types of plants than the others were already hitting. Exactly. So Picloram was 1,000 times more powerful than 2,4-D and was also effective on woody plants but didn't have the dioxin. So that was, I think, part of it. But it was used pretty extensively for deforestation. It was known to be used on woody plants and it was known to target conifers and so it was used in deforestation. In terms of its ability to defoliate, it didn't act as quickly as Agent Orange. Mm. But it was extremely powerful, and it just didn't act as quickly because it didn't have 245T, but it still had 24D, and it had this picloram, which is a thousand times more powerful than 24D, and is still effective against woody plants. So it was still very good at the deforestation that they were attempting, the defoliation. That's crazy, because they're just trying to kill all of the vegetation essentially, yeah. is, is what I'm hearing. Like, they have this one that's killing one type of plant. Oh, we need to kill these other plants. Let's kill all the plants. The U.S. military actually had enough Agent White to kill all of the plants in South Vietnam twice. <gasps> Holy shit. Yeah. And the other problem with Picloram is that it was highly mobile in soil, which means that it could really penetrate the soil, like, 20 feet down to get roots. And it would lateralize, meaning it wouldn't just go 20 feet down. It would also go out. It would get into rivers and streams. The The word ecocide actually originated with the use of picloran because of its ability to just decimate forests and its persistence in the environment. This is kind of crazy to think that that one's almost more intrusive than Agent Orange was, even though it might not act as immediately, because if I remember correctly with Agent Orange, it was in like one to three days that the plants were dying off, right? Yeah, and I think with Agent White, it was probably like just over three days. It wasn't slow by any means, but Agent Orange just acted more quickly. Like we discussed before with Agent Orange, nobody was overseeing the concentration in the Agent Orange. And so sometimes plants were dying almost immediately and then others a few days later. I mean, but still three days of plants, like not very many plants will die that quickly. Plants want to live. I mean... They say that it's powerful. Arthur Galston was the man who opposed the use of herbicides, and he coined the term ecocide. Mm. And he said that the use of picloram would lead to ecological catastrophe because of the scale on which they were used. But he also, he was an interesting guy. He was a botanist at Yale, and he actually created the precursor to 245T because he believed in the ability for herbicides to help humanity in, in terms of agriculture and getting weeds out of the food that we're eating. Sure. 
but it was advertised as the most powerful weed killer ever developed, and he knew intimately what that would mean. And it was so powerful that you could spray picloram on one leaf, and it would kill the whole plant. And so the fact that we were spraying it from planes was just, it was really just excessive. It was social warfare as much as it was ecological warfare. I, I do have more questions about that, but tell me a little bit more about blue. Okay. What was its function and objective? White was going to kill different types of plants that weren't able to be killed by agents orange, pink, purple, and green. Mm -hmm. So that's why they brought in the white, because mm -hmm. um, it had that picloram. Now, what about blue? How is it different? So blue was the one that they were using. I would say that this was intensely for psychological warfare because mm. blue was used on bamboo cover as well as rice and grain plants. And so they were saying that if they destroyed the food crops associated with the Viet Cong, that they could really show the power that they had over the Viet Cong because they were getting rid of their food supply. Right. But that wasn't entirely the case because even if you get intelligence that tells you this rice patty is associated with the Viet Cong, how credible is that? How easy is it to determine what rice patty is for the Viet Cong and what is just a civilian rice patty? Right, because there are farmers who are mom and pop farmers mm -hmm. that grow rice to sell at the local market. I also have a hard time with this because from what I learned about the Vietnam War last episode, we were trying to protect, protect in big air quotes, guys. Mm -hmm. We were trying to protect South Vietnam from North Vietnam, but South Vietnam is where we are employing all of these herbicides. So why are we fucking with the crops in South Vietnam? Yeah. Uh, I don't understand that. Why are we employing these psychological warfare tactics on the people that we're quote unquote protecting? Right. And that's a really tragic irony of the whole thing. Not only are we destroying the crops and the livelihood and the lives of the people that we're claiming that we're trying to protect from communism, but also, the Viet Cong was a military force that was being supported by North Vietnam. So they were able to get food supplies from elsewhere. They didn't need it from the communities that they were no. stationed near. No. And I just don't get that. Because do we know if any of the rainbow herbicides were used on land in North Vietnam? They were not. See, what the fuck? That doesn't make any sense. I'm And I'm sorry. But this doesn't make any sense to me. I don't think that we were technically able to go to North Vietnam because of the agreement that we made when we split Vietnam in North and South. And so America said, okay, we're going to try to keep South Vietnam. We're going to try to help it build a democracy. North Vietnam, you can do whatever you want because that's the agreement. And so I don't think that we technically had any business. We were like, North Vietnam is a lost cause, but we're going to protect South Vietnam. And I think that's why we didn't do anything there. The numbers are all there, but it doesn't add up. We're here to protect these people, but we're going to destroy their crops, destroy their livelihood. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I, I'm just going to get more and more heated and just keep repeating myself. So, was the application of agents blue and white um, and the other herbicides, purple, pink, green, the same as Agent Orange? Was it being sprayed from the airplanes as well as on the coasts and directly on the ground? As far as I know, it was definitely being sprayed by airplanes. I don't know about the coast and on the ground. I would assume so, especially with green, pink, and purple. Mm -hmm. um, and probably white because it was probably being applied in the same way that orange was once orange was stopped. Mm -hmm. But I know that they were being sprayed from planes for sure. Especially with white, if you were only spraying it on a small part of land because of what you said of how invasive it is, penetrating mm -hmm. not just the area, but deep, deep down and out laterally, that's, you don't have to spray as much as you think you need to because it's just going to keep traveling. With blue specifically, they also had this operation called Operation Pink Rose, and this is where they sprayed crops and forests with Agent Blue, and then they burnt the forest, which I'm not sure why they did, because they said that they were using the herbicides as an alternative to mechanical means, which I don't know that fire is a mechanical mean, but usually during war they might bulldoze a mm. forest to try mm -hmm. to get rid of cover. And so burning it seems like it falls kind of in under that, but with Pink Rose they sprayed the forests and then they burnt them, 
And the problem with that is the Agent Blue was an arsenical herbicide. And when you burn it, it makes the arsenic more intense and it makes oh. it airborne so that it was able to spread in the <sighs> plume from the fire. Oh my... So they just took something that's going to be dangerous to ingest... Let's just make it more potent and it's going to cover more land because when you have, like you said, that flume, the wind is going to carry it farther. So even if it doesn't, ugh. do we know if South Vietnam soldiers were tricked into applying any of the other herbicides to their land with that, um, like with Agent Orange and the deceitful Brother Nam campaign? I am not sure. I would think that it was all part of the same campaign. I don't know if, say, blue was being sprayed from the tanks on the backs of the soldiers or anything, but I would think so because Operation Ranch Hand, which we mentioned last time, was mm -hmm. actually part of a greater operation called Operation Trail Dust, which included Ranch Hand, Operation Fly Swatter, which was an anti-malaria operation where they used malathion, and we'll have to talk about that in another episode, but okay. that was not good. And mm. then also Operation Farmgate, which was the destruction of crops, which was primarily what Agent Blue was used for. So the short answer is I think so. And it's hard because we don't know for certain, like you said, because they don't even know. I'm almost sure that the soldiers didn't know what they were spraying half the time. They were just told, hey, guy, go mm -hmm. spray this around, please. What were the different types of effects on plants? I know with Agent Orange, you said it was hormone-based and it mm -hmm. caused them to kind of grow, grow, grow mm -hmm. so fast that... They basically couldn't keep up with themselves and died. Yes, yes. Same thing with white, where they would grow, 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 and then they wouldn't be able to keep up and then they'd die. Blue, since it used arsenic, it works on the level of phosphorylation with the plant, and so it replaces the phosphorus as it does in humans, but it also mm. dehydrates the plant. Mm. Which, and that's problematic. Well, especially in a rice patty where they really need a lot of water, and so it causes them to just shrivel up because they're dehydrated. And so it still has that, the plants look brown and they're just droopy. So I don't know that you could actually tell if one thing had been sprayed with blue or if it had been sprayed with orange or something else. Because the end result all looked similar to yeah. the untrained eye. Exactly. Do we know how long it took for blue to affect the plants? I looked some information up just about the effects of an arsenical herbicide on plants. Mm -hmm. And it looks like at fairly warm temperatures, like you would find in a jungle setting, it, it's also within two to three days of treatment that you mm. start seeing the effects on plants. So I would think that it's about the same timeline, maybe a little bit longer. So for all of these other colors in the spectrum, blue, white, pink, purple, green, mm -hmm. what were the different effects on humans? It's hard to differentiate the effects of pink, green, and purple from orange on humans. I would say that white is a little bit different. It would still have the same effects that 2,4-D had on humans. Mm -hmm. But picloram actually doesn't seem to have very high toxicity. One of the articles I researched actually had a table that compared pesticides to herbicides because the environmentalists were comparing the use of picloram, which is an herbicide, to DDT, which is that famous pesticide that mm. had a lot of impacts on human health and the environment that it was used in. Mm -hmm. And so this one compares DDT to parathion, 2,4-D, 2,4-5-T, and picloram. And in rats, they found that picloram does have a fairly high LD50. Mm. It also has a very low LD50 in fish. Oh. So a lot of the death from fish, when they would first walk into the jungle after it had been sprayed, the fish would just be floating in the rivers. That was probably due to the spraying of picloram. Agent Orange likely contributed, but they think most of the death of fish and phytoplankton was due to picloram. Mm, and that's Agent White. That's Agent White. Mm -hmm. The LD50 for picloram is not as low as for 2,4-D. Okay. But they did point out that it doesn't bioaccumulate which is important. What does that mean? It's not stored in your fat like DDT is, and actually none mm. of the herbicides store in your fat. Well, they did They did prove that orange does store in the fat, though. They proved that it stores in the body, but these are all tests that were done on animals, and so it's hard to say because you can't test on people necessarily, and if you find 2,4-D, who's to say if it's orange, who's to say if it's white? But they did compare the effects on animals, and so generally they think that picloram, which was used in white, is safe. 
And Picloram actually is still used today. It can't be used with 2,4-D because that's been outlawed because of the dioxin contamination. Picloram is still used today. And there's research to say, well, it seems to be toxic to female rats in particular and not male rats. So it's kind of still being studied, but it seems like it's generally non-toxic to humans. The FDA has established a safe drinking water standard for picloram, which is 500 parts per billion. And so if your water has picloram levels above 500 parts per billion, you might experience weakness, diarrhea, weight loss, and liver damage, as well as damage to the central nervous system, which sounds like it's still toxic, but it's not toxic on the same level and I know that this is nitpicking, but it, it doesn't seem to be a teratogen. It doesn't seem to be a carcinogen. It just seems to be causing these acute effects. Not the long-term stuff. Yeah, the long-term stuff, they don't seem to know. And and teratogen, again, is the birth defects, right? Yeah, it's damaging to a fetus. Got it. And I think part of it is that it's just so persistent. Where 2,4-D will be gone in one to four weeks, 2,4-5-T will be gone in one to 12 weeks, which is still, you would think, very long. Picloram is so persistent that it can remain in the soil for 52 to 78 weeks at detectable levels. Damn. So I think that's part of why it's so dangerous is because it just stays and it stays and it stays. And so if it's in your soil, if it's in your water, you will continually be exposed to it. Right. And that's, I guess, what would lead up to that chronic exposure instead of that acute moment where you have yeah. it one time, it makes you a little sick. But now we're just going to keep building it up, building it up. Yeah, but um, again, we don't have a whole lot of information on that. And like I said, they're still saying nowadays that picloram is generally beneficial when we're not using it for warfare because it is so good at preventing invasive species, so mm, invasive perennial woody plants from mm -hmm. potentially even killing big game in certain areas. And so they use it in national parks even as sort of the paper that I was reading called it an eco-ally. So where it began mm. its life and was the inspiration for ecocide and, and talks about that, it's now considered somewhat useful for the environment. So it's a pretty controversial herbicide even outside of its use in warfare. Yeah, with a lot of things, it could be helpful in some instances if you use its power for good, right. not evil, right? right. Mm -hmm. If you want to hear more on the health effects on humans of all of them except for what, maybe check back in on the Agent Orange episode. Blue does have different health effects. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Tell me more. Well, blue is an arsenical. Oh, so is it going to have, let me try to remember from our arsenic part one episode, like you said, it affects because it replaces the receptor for phosphorus in ATP. It replaces phosphorus in ATP. Yep. And mm -hmm. so that's what makes you sick and it gives you the nausea, the vomiting, mm -hmm. the neuropathy, shutting down your system essentially because it can't, mm -hmm. it can't go through its energy currency. Yeah, it can't, it can't exchange ATP for, for energy, and it can't be used as the currency in the body, essentially. Yeah, that's a really good summation. Good, good Yay! memory. Yay! Yeah. I, I learned things. Yeah, and while I was researching, I, I found these specifically, and so they try to tell vets that they need to be looking out for so many different diseases if they're going to try to get benefits for exposure to Agent Orange. And so some of the things that I found in particular... I mean, arsenic is arsenic, right? If it's the kind of arsenic that can hurt you, it's going to hurt you in all of those ways. But mm -hmm. some of the other things that I found, other diseases I found pointed out specifically were cancer of the bladder, lung, stomach, skin, lymph, liver, and leukemia, as well as DNA damage and cancer in fetuses. I've never heard of that before. Oh, yeah. A fetus, that's crazy. It kind of makes sense because fetuses are rapidly developing cells and so is cancer. And so it does make sense. But it's, it doesn't make it any less tragic. If the fetus does end up with cancer, are they able to come full term? And is that how we find out that they have cancer? That seemed more of like a, a rabbit hole down the obstetrics thing. But yeah, that's really sad. I think that has less to do with the servicemen that we sent over and that came back. And I think it has more to do with... Um, the civilians civilians and uh, women who are part of the Viet Cong and so any any fetuses that they may have tried to bring to term. Would it be safe to say that there's a good chance that if someone is exposed to Agent Orange 
that there's a high likelihood that they were exposed to agents blue, white, and the other herbicides in the spectrum? I would say so. I mean, if you were exposed to Agent Orange between 1965 and 1970, you probably weren't exposed to green, pink, or purple because those were all prior to Agent Orange, but you may have been exposed to Agent Blue and maybe not Agent White, but probably Agent Blue. I want to talk more about the psychological warfare aspect that you talked about because I know that you said that they wanted to mess with their food and crops, right? They wanted to do this with the Viet Cong and the North Vietnam side, but we're attacking South Vietnam. They're affecting their food supply, which, you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs at the very base of it, your basic needs in life are food and shelter. Mm -hmm. So they're messing with their food. How was the food supply impacted initially? I don't think that it it impacted the Viet Cong, actually. As much as it was part of the psychological warfare on the Viet Cong, I think that it mostly impacted this ethnic group in Vietnam. The Viet Cong were thought by the United States military to be using rice paddies that had been abandoned. And they had potentially, but not certainly, been abandoned by an ethnic minority in Vietnam called the Montagnards. Yards. And so Mm. if the fields were sprayed and they weren't actually abandoned, this minority group was being targeted. And were not the intended target. They were not the intended target. I can't get over how just not well thought out that is. Like, the injustice is just incredible. On top of everything else, it's like, okay, now we're targeting this one ethnic group because we think our intelligence has said that this rice paddy has been abandoned, but it hasn't. The attacking the food supply resulted in 1.5 million people uprooting and moving to urban areas, and mostly they had to move into the slums of Saigon because there wasn't space for them. They didn't have time to plan to move. Their whole livelihood was centered around agriculture, and now they don't have that. They have no means of supporting themselves, but they can't live where they were living because they can't eat the food there. They can't make money there. So 1.5 million people were impacted That's insane. just by the attack on the food supply. You just answered my next question because it's like, okay, we're messing with their food, mm-hmm. and now we're messing with their shelter. And these 1.5 million people aren't even the bad guy. No. Like, what the fuck, America? (laughs) So when they moved, they're moving into the more urban areas, as you said, but how do they make a living now? I don't know. I mean, there were quite a few refugees when the war ended, and so it's a potential that there were people who were refugees before the war ended. Okay. Had moved to Saigon and then said, this isn't working, we need to leave. And so it's hard. It's hard to generalize, like, how these 1.5 million people were further impacted after they lost their homes. If you're a farmer in rural America and you have to shut down and go move to New York City or LA, you're, and I say this with love, a country bumpkin and you don't know how to make it in the big city. You don't know how to do urban type of jobs. Mm -hmm. And it's not like you can just, oh, I'm gonna move to LA, but I'm gonna continue to be a farmer. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna carve out my little piece of land and do some farming. Like, no, you're fucked. And it's not just that only the Montan Yards were targeted and were impacted, but if they were an ethnic minority, how well were they received in Saigon? Sure, yeah, no, that's a point that I didn't even think about. Okay, so we don't have food. We don't have a job, you don't have shelter, not to mention these devastating health effects that nobody even knows is coming, not Mm -hmm. to mention the impact on the land long term. This just makes everything even worse. Let's move to more long term now. Are the crops still being affected today? And if they are, how? Yes. So the crops that have been sprayed with arsenic can pretty much never recover. Arsenic can never be removed unless there's some sort of remediation program to remove the arsenic from the soil. It'll just keep being taken up by the plants and it will persist in the soil until humans intervene and do something about it. So is there a way to clean it up to stop that cycle? There is. We would basically have to do the same thing that the U.S. is doing in Vietnam for remediating places that have been impacted by dioxins. They'd have to do essentially the same thing. 
And so do they just basically just like dig out all of the ground? Because like you said, it how deep it goes. I think so. I mean, well, arsenic doesn't go very deep. Pichlorium was the one that, that went really deep. And I don't think that the pichlorium is probably still around. They might still be exper experiencing the impact of the dioxins from, you know, 2,4-D and everything. But the arsenic will persist. And so they would have to do something to remediate arsenic. And I'm not entirely sure what they'd have to do. I think that it probably would be a lot of digging. It would probably have to be a lot of something like that. Well, if it's just going to continue to persist, it's almost like you just have to cut it out. You just yeah. have to get it all out and then start fresh. I hope that there is some bright kid somewhere that is researching this and how to remediate it. I'd like to hope that there's a way. I'd like to hope there's a way that someday that land can be taken back by the yeah. secondary generate third generations. It's difficult because, I mean, arsenic is naturally present in the Earth's crust, too. So what do you do about something that's supposed to be there, just not in these concentrations? Even if the crops can't grow there, have people been able to return back to those areas to live? Or will they eventually be safe to live? I don't mm. think so. It, and it's hard to say because so many people did flee from South Vietnam mm -hmm. after the war. But there were, of course, a lot of people who couldn't afford to leave at any point. Mm. And so those are the people who are being impacted by the birth defects and the health defects. And they're being impacted by the amount of arsenic that's present in the soil there, especially in the rice paddies, which arsenic and rice is kind of a worldwide issue. Interesting. There was a study put out by Consumer Reports in 2014, which was a follow-up report to a 2012 study mm -hmm. about the amount of arsenic in different kinds of grains. So mm -hmm. basmati rice from California had the lowest arsenic, but it still had present amount of arsenic, right? It had detectable amounts. That's and again, crazy. like I said, it's present in the earth's soil, so it's unavoidable. But if you know about it, and if you know it's the staple for a lot of people because of how easy it is to get rice, then you want to be aware of that. Quinoa wow. had a low arsenic concentration. Buckwheat had a low arsenic concentration. Rices from Texas, as far as the United States was concerned, had the highest amount of arsenic. Interesting. And then brown rice actually had 80% more arsenic than <gasps> white rice. I used to be a manager at a sushi bar. The white rice that we used was not gluten-free because of the things that we would add in for the sushi seasoning, right? Mm -hmm. And so a lot of people, because gluten-free was really hot during this time, not for people who just had Crohn's and celiac, but as a lifestyle choice. And everybody was eating brown rice. Everybody. Yeah. yeah, and I mean, we can talk about how arsenic is even high in the United States and how we're trying to do things to make sure that it's within a proper dietary level. And actually the Consumer Report did want the FDA to intervene and do something about the high amounts of arsenic they found. Southeast Asia in particular has pretty significant problems with arsenic in their rice. And so Bangladesh and West Bengal and India both have been identified as being highly affected by arsenic contamination of groundwater, which affects their rice. These areas in Bangladesh and West Bengal where the worst contamination has been recorded, they have 3,200 micrograms per liter of arsenic in their groundwater, comparatively. Groundwater samples from the upper Mekong River Basin in Cambodia, which is near South mm -hmm. Vietnam, mm -hmm. had arsenic ranges up to 855 micrograms per liter for groundwater, and there was also an arsenic concentration of up to 1,351 micrograms per liter reported for the lower Mekong Delta in Vietnam. I haven't seen anything that showed a direct corollary because I don't think that there were any groundwater samples being taken to test for arsenic prior to like 1990. But the fact that Southeast Cambodia and Southern Vietnam have such high arsenic concentrations, I would think has at least a little bit to do with the use of Agent Blue in those regions. If this is such a common thing that arsenic is present in rice and these other grains, if you eat rice daily, like a lot of people do, mm -hmm. is it enough to make you sick and have some of those issues? I would or think so. Yeah. Wow. I mean, at least chronic. It's one of those things where we were talking in our arsenic episode about how it's hard to establish a lethal dose amount, but there was that 22-year-old who had a lifetime of drinking contaminated groundwater and died as a result of chronic arsenic poisoning. Okay, so they might be able to live there. They might not, but yeah. likely they wouldn't be able to move back. 
Probably to... not. I mean, okay. if they know about the danger, I don't think they would want to. But I don't know if there's people who fully even understand. Because it's been so long, too. Right. So it's hard to say. Has the U.S. tried to aid the people of Vietnam in any way? Financially, medical research, attempts to restore the land that was destroyed, even if it's not fully possible. Was there an attempt made at all? There was some attempt made, but it definitely doesn't seem like enough to me. I don't know if there is any aid that we could provide that would be quote unquote enough, considering how many people have been affected and how many generations who weren't even alive when this was happening that have been affected. I don't know that we could ever do repairs for this. In 2011, the U.S. joined Vietnam in the first phase of a dioxin soil cleanup. And at the time, the article that I read was written, which was, I think, only a couple years ago, the United States had spent more than $84 million cleaning up a former airbase in Da Nang. But it's just the U.S. airbase, which is why I think that it's not nearly enough, because there are up to 25 other dioxin-contaminated sites, and probably more, that still exist without remediation. And they're only focusing on dioxins. So what about the effects of arsenic? Picloron maybe isn't as big of a deal. Maybe those areas can recover. And these are just dioxin hotspots. They're not even the full area. We sprayed an area the size of Massachusetts. And cleaning up an air base has already cost $84 million, and it's barely scratched the surface. Well, yeah, and this is an American air base. I don't see how many people of Vietnam are living or working at this... American yeah. airbase. I try to avoid shoulds, but <laughs> we ideally should be doing more for yeah. the land of Vietnam and the people of Vietnam. I imagine that after the war and after they halted the use of Agent Orange, that they had a surplus lying around of all of these. How were they stored or disposed of? What did that look like? They were stored in those 55-gallon drums that they arrived in with the different stripes that indicated what kind of agents they were. And so the operation to destroy them was called Operation Pacer Ho and Operation Pacer Ivy. And these were when they took the unidentified, unused, partially used herbicides and they transported them for the relabeling, re-drumming, and shipment to Johnston Island in the Pacific Ocean and then incinerated them which oh yeah yeah and th this may not be the only way that they disposed of them either this sounds as absurd to me as hearing about when we were going to shoot nuclear waste into space because why the fuck not that sounds insane like why would that be a good idea why I did mention in the last episode that we stored them at various military bases mostly outside of the United States but there was also an article that I read that said that there have been positive tests for 2,4,5-T in the soil in Okinawa. And so the researcher said that he thinks that some barrels of agents pink and green were just kind of tossed over there and not recorded because we may have underestimated the amount that we sprayed. We may have underestimated the amount that was used, so we don't know. We don't know if everything that we didn't use was destroyed. And so he thinks that some barrels of pink and green were shipped to the Kadena Air Force Base in Okinawa and buried. And the soil samples that they took that tested positive for 245T were under a soccer field near the Bob Hope Primary School and the Amelia Hart Intermediate School. This is so hard to stomach. Is there any end in sight at all for the devastation that all of these herbicides have caused? I don't think so. The people, I think, will be experiencing effects for quite some time. It's hard to say when that will come to an end. And I think that the environment is going to continue to suffer as well because the places that have arsenic may never recover, the places that have dioxin may never recover. We've already talked about the damage that the deforestation took to the topsoil and to the flora and fauna of mm. the places that used to be mangrove canopies. It's, I mean, ecocide really is the best word. There really yeah. was ecological warfare that took place. Absolutely. And on top of that, from one of those documentaries that I watched about the children who were, there were third and fourth generation children in this mm -hmm. documentary 
And one of them was saying that the effects seem to be getting worse mm -hmm. the longer that it goes on. And I just can't get their, their faces out of my head and think about this was how long ago? I mean, this was what, 40, 50 years ago? And this is still affecting people. This is, it's outrageous. Our focus has obviously been on the uses by the American military in the Vietnam War. You mentioned in our coverage of Agent Orange that that herbicide had been used by other countries. Is this also the case of the other rainbow herbicides? So arsenicals aren't a very popular choice of herbicide, but Picloram, that partial ingredient for mm -hmm. Agent White, it was actually pretty popular. It was pretty popular worldwide and in developed countries. It was used for deforestation and to control weeds in agriculture. And then as there were attempts made in the 1960s through the 1980s to help developing countries also mm. have the same quality of life through agriculture, Picloram was actually used fairly commonly there as well. And that's not the same as Agent White. As I've said. Right, because Agent White had the 2,4-D in it? Yes, yes. As but, well, okay. The chlorium was used, and I think that it is still used, but it, it's not the same as using Agent White. The only other place that I could find was actually what we mentioned the last episode where I was saying that in South Africa, mm -hmm. there were people who were told to mix chemicals together and they knew they were mixing 2,4-D. They were actually mixing picloram because they wanted to kill the cassava plants in South Africa as crop destruction for part of the warfare that they were conducting down there. But most of the uses that picloram-based herbicides are used today are not war-related? No, they are restricted in their use and so they can't be used domestically but they are not war-related. Okay. I, I feel like the only good thing to come of this is that we understand now how destructive they are. The word environment actually finally came into international humanitarian law in 1976 with the passage of the Environmental Modification Convention, and this was a direct response to the use of herbicides in Vietnam. Mm. And so even though in 1962 we were saying pesticides aren't good and we need to identify the different chemicals that we're using domestically to try to improve our quality of life, it became more of an international issue after the herbicides used in Vietnam, which is a shitty way for us to realize that the environment is important important but we did sure. but at the same time now we're realizing that it's important and we have all these remediation things that we need to do and who knows if they'll ever actually be conducted well yeah i mean in one of the documentaries that i saw they showed the da Nang air force base mm -hmm. and they said that that's where there were u.s cleanup actions being taken but then they pan out and you see this shot and it's literally just looks like there are just tarps laid over these areas of ground and there were all of these big heavy equipment like tractors and bulldozers and, but they're not moving they're not doing anything so it's like yeah there was a thought of doing these things and doing this cleanup but it's obviously not happening it feels just very after the fact with having those conventions being written up after the vietnam war everybody probably saw how devastated vietnam was and was like oof i don't want that to be us ever mm. so Orange was contaminated with dioxins. That was the heavy-duty destructive part of that. Mm -hmm. What about with the others? Did they have any other big contaminants? Yes. So along with white having 2,4-G, which was potentially dangerous because of contamination, it was also contaminated with hexachlorobenzene, which is another byproduct formed during the manufacture of chemicals. And it was actually used widely as a pesticide until 1965, but chronic oral exposure in humans results in liver disease and associated skin lesions. That sounds about just as fun as the chloracne. Yeah, it also has toxicity for the liver, ovary, and central nervous system, and it can trigger porphyria. The disease that I have that is a not great time. That's insane. I had no idea about that. Yeah, even though they were like, maybe picloram isn't that dangerous and we're going to continue to use it domestically, there were also contaminants in white that were dangerous. And I don't know if we know the concentrations of these contaminants. Right. I don't know if those were examined, but hexachlorobenzene has no commercial use as a pesticide. And it's, it's like dioxins in that... You can't there is have, no benefit. There's no benefit. It's just dangerous, 
And when you have a chemical that you know hexachlorobenzene is created during the formation, there are restrictions on how much hexachlorobenzene can be in it. And at this point, it might be zero. With the porphyria, you mentioned skin lesions being mm -hmm. a problem. Mm -hmm. Is the type of porphyria, because there are different sub types of porphyria, is it the porphyria cutana tarde? I don't know. I don't know if it is the same porphyria. That type makes people sensitive to light. I don't know if it's that. They might just be shorthand saying porphyria when they mean porphyria right. cutana tarda because we, mm -hmm. we know that that's associated with Agent Orange, so they might right. just be saying that it's the same thing. In one of the articles I read, it explicitly said that it can trigger porphyria, and it may have been that cutana tarda. That's crazy. It is not a fun disease, and I don't mm -hmm. wish it on my worst enemy. Mm -hmm. That's wild. Do any of the other agents have uses today or in other places of the world? So there was a 2005 article I read, and the author was upset and was trying to inform people living near Maine that the Maine Army National Guard had, th they there was some leaked information or somebody realized that they had been using Agent Purple for 30 years at their training. It was sprayed over thousands of acres of land and it was going into the water supply and on the ground near where the Maine Army National Guard had been training. And purple had more dioxins than orange. So it was super upsetting to read about this. And I, d I don't know that this got widespread coverage outside of Maine, but it points out that maybe not all of the agents were disposed of. And why are they still using it? Why were why? they still using it? This, this article is 16 years old at this point, but why were they still using it so long after there was supposed to be disposed of? Well, not only disposed of, but we had information mm -hmm. saying this is bad news. This is some bad shit. You do not want to mess with it. Right. And Don't do it. It's us putting our own service people in danger again because we're just exposing people who are supposedly trying to protect their own country and they're putting them at risk. Right. Stay classy, America. All right. We're going to end it on a little bit of a somber note, as seems... Mm -hmm pertinent. And so I just want to go ahead and give some statistics about the use of herbicides in Vietnam. The Vietnam War lasted for 20 years from November 1st, 1955 to April 30th, 1975. The United States' involvement in the war was from 1955 to 1973, but only began the use of herbicides in 1961. Between 1961 and 1973, the United States conducted 6,500 spraying missions, which resulted in the spraying of 20 million gallons of herbicides over a section of South Vietnam, roughly the size of the U.S. state of Massachusetts. However, the sprays also impacted Cambodia and Laos. Of these 20 million gallons of herbicides, which is almost certainly an underestimate, over 11,700,000 gallons of Agent Orange, including Agent Orange 2, Agent Orange 3, and Super Orange were sprayed, accounting for 61% of the total herbicides used. Between 1961 and 1963, 8,000 gallons of Agent Green was sprayed. Between 1961 and 1964, over 122,000 gallons of Agent Pink were sprayed. Between 1961 and 1965, 145,000 gallons of Agent Purple were sprayed. All of these agents contained dioxins, resulting in 1,175 pounds of dioxins being sprayed over South Vietnam. Between 1965 and 1971, Nearly 5,240,000 gallons of Agent White were sprayed. Between 1962 and 1971, over 2,160,000 gallons of arsenic-containing Agent Blue were sprayed over 38 square miles of mangrove forests and 1,158 square miles of rice paddies. The presence of arsenic in the soil still impacts the lives of 15 million people living and working in the Mekong River Delta. During the course of the war, 40% of total usable forest in South Vietnam was destroyed from bombing, napalm, and the spraying of rainbow herbicides. More than 47 square miles of coastal mangrove was destroyed. 
5,019 square miles of upland inland forest was destroyed with 50% tree mortality. The environment may never recover. At least 1.5 million people were uprooted by the use of Agent Blue on the food supply and forced into the slums of Saigon. In 2011, the United States and Vietnam began dioxin cleanup at a former U.S. airbase in Da Nang, which has already cost over $84 million. At least 25 other dioxin hotspots still exist without remediation. The war claimed the lives of roughly 2 million Vietnamese citizens and 1.35 million Vietnamese soldiers. 58,200 U.S. servicemen died or went missing during the war. South Korea lost 4,000 service people. Thailand lost 350. Australia lost over 500. Canada lost over 100. And New Zealand lost three dozen soldiers. The Vietnamese government estimates that 4 million Vietnamese people were exposed to the rainbow agents, 3 million of which suffer health consequences. They also estimate that 400,000 were directly killed or maimed by exposure to rainbow agents during the Vietnam War. Approximately 2.6 million Americans were exposed to rainbow agents, with an estimated 1 million suffering health consequences. In 1979, a lawsuit was filed on behalf of 2.4 million American veterans exposed to rainbow agents. In 1984, an out-of-court settlement resulted in seven large manufacturers paying $180 million to veterans and their next of kin. Various challenges followed, and by 1988, the settlement had risen to $240 million. The Department of Veterans Affairs only recognizes spina bifida and children of service members exposed to rainbow agents and no other birth defects. Since 2001, they have received over 8,100 claims of spina bifida, but only 1,325 have received benefits. The government of Vietnam does not recognize children with birth defects as victims of exposure to rainbow agents. Not only are all of these numbers severe underestimates of exposure, but citizens of Vietnam continue to be exposed to the chemicals in the rainbow agents. Children continue to be born with birth defects as a result of exposure worldwide. It has been nearly half a century since the United States ended its attack on South Vietnam, and still the effects of our presence there persists. We will never truly know the full extent of the damage that Agent Orange and the other rainbow agents has had on the world and the environment, and it is unlikely that they will cease their legacy of destruction in our lifetime. Many thanks to Newt Ronan for allowing us to read a portion of his poem, Agent Orange Trilogy at the beginning of this episode. Thanks also to Z for reading the poem for us. Additional music in this episode is As the Fires Burn by Evergreen Refuge. More of their music can be found on bandcamp.com. Thank you for listening. Thank you for joining us. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Please like, follow, subscribe, and review us wherever you get your podcasts. For more Lethal Dose content, you can find us at Lethal Dose Pod on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok. For an overdose of content, subscribe on Patreon for exclusive episodes and much more. The show theme is Look Far by our dear wizard friend Fogweaver. More of their music can be found on Bandcamp.com. Lethal Dose is created, researched, produced, and edited by Kayla Woods and Venus Dineko. Stay safe, and remember, the dose makes the poison.